All right, guys, we are going to move on to so the sodium potassium pump, which is a specific kind of active transport. Sorry, give me a minute to get back where I need to be. All right, so the sodium potassium point uh, pump is arguably the most important active transport pipe pump in our body. Um, and this is used in every animal cell to transport sodium and potassium to make sure that there's a high concentration of potassium and a low concentration of sodium in the cell. There wants to be uh, sodium, um, there's more sodium extracellularly, so it's constantly being pumped out and needs energy for that. And sodium, they want to get potassium in. And again, there's usually going to be more of a concentration on the inside, so it's still pumping in. They're going against the gradient in both cases. So what happens is the pump binds to ATP. You need ATP to make it work. Then three intracellular sodium ions, so three sodium ions on the inside, attach. And then ATP breaks, which is hydrolyzed. And because of that, you have now a phosphorus so it's been phosphorylated. Um, and then ADP is released and that phosphate is there. And then the pump changes shape and those three ions get pumped out. And when that happens, then two sodiums bond, or not sodiums, I'm sorry, two potassiums bond and it changes shape again and lets it in, um, transporting them in. So unphosphorylated form of the pump has a higher affinity for sodium ions than potassium ions. So the two bound potassium ions are released. ATP binds and the process starts again. So uh, let me go back to the picture. So when it is open like this, three sodiums will come in and attach. And then ATP will bind and break, leaving ADP. Here's ADP coming off, and the P is still there. And the three are pumped out. Then two potassiums come on, and it changes back. The, this phosphate pops off. This two get, get to released inside the cell. But because once it's been changed, this shape fits the sodium better than it did with the phosphorus. So then they just get released. And that's it continues to happen over and over again. So it needs that ATP to give it that phosphorus to make that change happen. So the sodium potassium pump is a major contributor in establishing the blank of a cell. Pump direction, osmolality, pump or ATP, or membrane potential. Did you say membrane potential? Good. Um, that's going to make the charges on the each side of the cell a specific charge for the cell to do its job. The sodium potassium pump, how many sodium ions are initially bind to the transport protein? One, two, three, or four? Did you say three? Good. All right. The binding of sodium ions does not change the shape of the protein until potassium ions bind. True or false? False. Good. Um, it changes when um, the phosphorus is attached and allows that to happen. The sodium potassium pump passes more sodium out than potassium in, more potassium out than sodium for a one for one basis, or I'm sorry, potassium out and sodium out on a one for one basis, sodium out and potassium out on for in for a one for one basis, or sodium and potassium in the same direction. Say more sodium out than potassium in. Good. Okay. Your neurons really utilize this to make them work. They need that um, action potential, that membrane potential to work, remembering from anatomy. Um, so they need that unequal distribution of the sodium and potassium ions to make the signals transla transport through. Um, the resting membrane, membrane potential in a neuron is going to be um, negative 60 to negative 18 millivolts. So normally the inside of the cell is a negative 60 or negative 80 compared to the outside. Then it starts generating or pumping and it'll change it. So a certain amount of sodium and potassium are always leaking across the membrane, but that sodium, um, but the sodium potassium pumps in the membrane relatively actively restore and the ions to the appropriate size. Sides. Sorry, guys. So, those action potentials are passed on by the neurons depolarizing. 
um, as the action potential triggers the membrane potential, um, it goes to negative 40 to negative 55 millivolts. So it actually becomes more positive. And when that happens, the threshold is reached, the sodium opens, and the sodium ions will rush into the cell. And because that's going to move passively now, and there's more on the outside than the inside. That influx of sodium triggers potassium gates to open, releasing the potassium. So now potassium gets to go the way it wants to, and that'll depolarize the cell. Once that happens, then that impulse gets to travel to the next channel, and then it happens again. During then when it's going to an original state, the sodium potassium pumps help get it back to that negative 60 to negative 80. So it starts out with sodium and potassium pumps doing their job. You have it sitting here at the resting member potential. Um, the, so the sodium potassium pump is doing its job a little, but it's not really, it's just kind of maintaining. Then it gets an impulse, and when it gets an impulse, sodium channels open. And all of a sudden, this previously negative, because it was more negative here than it was out here, this previously negative thing gets super positive on the inside. So then the membrane potential shoots up to a positive. When that happens, the potassium pumps are like, hey, wait, what's happening? And it opens up and all the potassiums go running out. Bye, see ya, passively. This is all passive. And that makes it more positive. Then, after that or then when the potassium is only ones leaving and sodium is the only ones, or is sodium is no longer moving, it starts to repolarize, starts to go back down towards the negative. And then we have the sodium potassium pump that helps fix it to get it back to its resting membrane potential. Then there are proteins that signal, that say, hey, I need this, or whatever. So cellular signaling is a complex system of communication that governs the basic cellular activities that do everything for the cell. The ability of the cells to perceive and correctly respond to their microenvironments is based on this. So tissue repair, immunity, all that is part of this. So you have the cell membrane right here. You have the stuff on the outside of the cell, the extracellular. And then you have these signal um, proteins and something will bond to it and then it will cause this chain reaction as it sends information, 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 information till it gets to the, um, the nucleus of the cell. Then the nucleus decides, oh, we need to make more of this amino acid or more of this amino acid so then transcription will occur um, and transcription and translation. Um, so that's how that works. Notice one of the things that is really moving is the phosphorus. So, cells within multicellular organisms must communicate with each other to maintain life. The single cell organisms communicate with each other for symbiotic tasks. So, um, bacteria, single cell organisms actually will work together so they can protect each other and or um, get food or whatever. So, they're constantly signaling each other. So, you need these appropriate signal pathways to get that to make, to make that happen. So, which of the following organisms would not likely show communication pathways to the others? A peacock, a turtle, a butterfly, a shark, or an alligator? Did you say sea butterfly? Good. Because everything else is going to be in a, the chordate family. So, um, peacocks, turtles, sharks, alligators, they all have an endoskeleton. They all have a more common anatomy. The butterfly is an arthropod. It has an exoskeleton. It's much smaller. So, it's the most different. So, they're probably not going to have the exact same communication pathways as the others. Signal transduction. So, to make the signal go from one part of the cell to the other, you need these signal transduction, and that happens with some transcription factors and cofactors. They cause the cell to respond to the signal in the environment in a very specific way. So this signal is anything that the cell has to respond to. It could be light, it could be chemicals, it could be hormone, it could be heat, it could be touch. Anything that a cell will respond to, and you can kind of think of what you respond to. You respond to chemicals when you're like, ooh, that smells delicious, I'm going to go get a cookie. Or, um, ooh, that smells terrible, I'm leaving this room. Or um, touch, when somebody gives you a hug, you like it. Or when somebody punches you, you don't. You're responding to all those things. 
the tr signal transduction pathway proceeds with the reception of the signal and then it trans translates transduces that signal all the way through to the DNA to the nucleus so it can express the right transcription factors so here's my signal and it reaches the cell surface mm -hmm. there's a receptor there my signal protein receptor and it will bind to that com that kind of signal it depends on what kind of signal we're looking for so if this one if they match they will bind then that will activate the receptor and that'll start a process that'll get that information to the DNA so it'll go through these specific transcription factors here in DNA trans this transcription factor will say we need to make more of this amino acid so then that'll send it out and it'll make the cell will then make what it needs to make make more of that amino acid which will make more of that protein so which of the following is an example of a signal that can start a signal transduction pathway heat light hormone are all of the above did you say all of the above? Good. The activated metabolic process is in the signal transduction pathway produces A, a transcription factor, B, cell movement, C, a, cell, a signal, or D, receptors on the cell membrane. So what does the activated process make? Did you say a transcription factor? Right. So the transcription factor is what is produced to make the cell do what it needs to do. Which of the following correctly illustrates a signal transduction pathway? Light is absorbed by chlorophyll molecules. The chlorophyll releases a transcription factor. An antigen binds to the antibodies on the surface of a cell. The antibodies break down the foreign cell's membrane, causing cell death. Glucose enters the cell via transport proteins. A metabolic pathway within the cell causes synthesis and release of insulin. Or D, all of the above. Did you say D? Good. These are all very specific examples. This one, uh, the first one, fits exactly what I've been saying. Some sort of signal hits the, um, the membrane um, receptor, and then a transcription factor is released. In this case, the antigen binds to the antibody. Again, signal receptor on the surface of the cell, and then it gets broken down, and then the cell, and the cell will break it down sending the transcription factors that allow that to break down and causing cell death. That's going to be another one. So that cell, that infected cell can't live, so if it can't live, it can't pass on the information, pass on the, um, the bacterium, the disease, the sickness, whatever. Glucose inserts via the transport cell, the metabolic pathway in the cell causes synthesis and release of insulin, and that happened again because of a transport protein, I'm sorry, a transcription factor that caused the synthesis and release of insulin. So all of them are correct. And in the next video, we will talk about the regulation of these things. So in this video, we talked about some specific active transport, um, AT, or the sodium potassium pump spe specifically, and how that transmits the signal in muscle cells and nerve cells. We talked specifically about nerve cells in this one. We also talked about signal pathways and how different signals can cause different things to occur and how they produce some sort of transcription factor that happens within the cell that allows the cell to respond to its environment. And that can happen um, within cell to cell or if it's a single cell organism, organism to organism. And that's it for today. All right. Have a great day, everybody.